So we have an illustrious panel. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask the panel just to, if we can go along, starting with Helen, if you can just say who you are, um, where you're from, what roles you have, particular passions, anything that struck you about the conference today, anything you want to say, really. Um, so my name's Helen Shannon. I'm a born and bred Londoner, and I love London. And uh, I work for the London Diocese a couple of days a week as their estates enabler. I'm a church planter on, uh, we moved into an estate 15 years ago. I, before that, I was like the archetypal teenage single mum on the estate, and I met Jesus, and I saw people, I saw my life transformed, and I saw people come to know Jesus, and yet they couldn't get embedded in a local church. And I realised then, and there we need to take the church to people rather than people come into the church um, so that's what I'm passionate about we've just planted a new church which is the first time I'm leaving them to it today I've been watching their little whatsapp group it's led by local leaders and it's on our neighboring estate so it's one one estate taking good news to the next estate and I'm so excited about it amazing uh, so, uh, my name's Mark Powley. I'm uh, Archbishop's Mission Enabler for the North. So, uh, before this, I was a principal of St. Hild College, uh, which uh, trains ordinands and does theology and has a centre for church planting. And then my job is to work with each of the 12 northern dioceses towards the vision and strategy that we were hearing about yesterday. So, what would it look like if all 12 northern dioceses pulled together and prayed together for those great uh, ambitious goals we looked at yesterday? Uh, what would facilitate that? Uh, and I'm in a kind of listening and consultation process about how to do that. And part of my passion is if we're going to you know, have these, what in the north would be 3,000 new worshipping communities, how do we make sure they are diverse, representative uh, and healthy? And so this, uh, this day has been a, a great kind of contribution to that. Good morning. Um, I don't just pray. <laughs> My name's Reverend Dean. I'm from Aldershot in Hampshire, home of the shrinking British Army, because um, there are other places I know. Um, I too am a Londoner. I won't fight with you about which part of London's better, but uh, south of the river where there's no tube. <laughs> so that tells you all you need to know. Um, I'm also a trustee on NECN. Thank you, Bishop Lynn, for the invitation. I've also been on the Commission for Urban Life and Faith that you haven't mentioned. That was the follow-up to Faith in the City, 20 years on. So I was one of the, on the commission for that. I love young people. My passion is soul music. I love Tamla Motown, really. and love to do a theology on Tamla Motown and Stevie Wonder particularly. Is that going to stretch? Other mic. Uh, my name's Rob. I'm the group chief executive, that sounds very grand, of Church Urban Fund. Uh, and I'm also the chair of Housing Justice, which uh, is a charity you also may have had some dealings with at some point. Uh, and both these charities exist to serve you. So if you can share with me, uh, as we go forward, the best ways in which I can serve your ministry. Because as far as I'm concerned, everyone here is the most important person in the room. <laughs> I'm Andrew Kwapong. I was uh, brought up in King's Cross um, at a, in a very small local estate church, um, which was really formative for me. Um, the original church burnt down and they sort of started again um, and really engaged me with the housing estates of which you know, I was brought up on. Um, I've, been, I've worked for London City Mission for about 15 years, um, involved in church planting on housing estates in Tottenham. Um, yeah, so I, I was a youth worker for seven years before that. Um, I'm now uh, just finishing training, um, um, end of my curacy. Um, so yeah, in, in Hendon, but always really interested in how we engage on housing estates and how actually the edges need to be forming what the center looks like. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, thank you. So I'm Rachel Gardner. I'm also a Londoner. My family is South London. We were homeless as a family for about five years, sofa surfing, and ended up moving on to the Ashburnham community of the South Coast. So that's where I grew up, which is why we don't ever lock our vicarage front door. I'm just not used to that. So um, about five years ago, God called us, my husband's a vicar, called us to uh, get involved with the, the first HDB church plant in the north. That was in Preston. 
um, Jason went to check it out and rang me and said, ah, oh, my drug dealer used to live there and this is the graveyard I used to uh, sort of sleep off all the hangovers. So interestingly for us, coming back to a place where um, Jason's roots, he was a drug user and a drug dealer, and um, the work we did at Preston Minster, helping them get established, then planting into Blackburn, which is a recovery estate. Lots of adults in our estate are either in active recovery or struggle with drug and alcohol use, and we um, are growing a church which is for all ages. It's a parish church. Parish ministry is so key. The inherited congregation are the beating heart of this church plant, but we centre children and young people. If this doesn't connect with children and young people, we are not doing it. And so any adults that are part of the church are part of that mission. And, it's, and we've seen really exciting things happen. We've got two adopted children. So probably like lots of you in this room, my heart is still wide open after that last session. It's hard to switch that off, isn't it? So um, I think we all bring this to you in a spirit of uh, just tenderness and awareness of just how we might all be feeling. So I'm excited to be here. I didn't know quite that I was allowed in this room because I feel like I've got the big learner plates on in terms of church planting. I'm new to it. I'm new to urban, to estate ministry. Um, but I've learned so much from being here. Thank you so much. I feel like I'm surrounded by absolute giantesses and giants in the gospel. So thank you. Uh, uh, my name's Nick. Uh, as you'll soon hear from my accent, I'm not from London. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Way back when, I grew up on a small outer estate outside Enniskillen in Northern Ireland. I, that was all my youth spent there. Um, I now have one of the daftest job titles in the Church of England. So I am officially the director for ministry for the Church of England. Fantastic. Which, which, <laughs> which just feels ridiculous every time I say it. Um, but as I, um, I came into that role in the summer, and as I was going through the appointment process, I pointed out to them that 22% of the population of England live in extreme English poverty. And by that I mean 22% of the population live in a parish that's amongst the 10% most deprived. And I said, if you appoint me, I will want us to take steps towards 22% of our worshippers being from those communities, and 22% of our lay and ordained leaders coming from those communities and retaining their cultural and social capital. So I am massively invested in the work that you're doing and I feel like a complete imposter sitting here before you today. Wonderful, so now you know who they all are. Um, we've got a chance now to ask um, some questions. Um, we've got, as I say, about an hour um, uh, ask whatever you want. I'm just going to pitch it open to the panel. I personally hate it when I'm on a panel and somebody asks a question around kind of macroeconomics and then they say, Lynn, what do you think about this? And I'm like, oh. So, so I'd rather just let the panel sort out who they think is best to answer a particular question. But anybody else pitch in, obviously. So does anybody want to begin? Well, thanks. Um, this might be a bit of an outlier question. Um, we heard about all the money that's been put in these new plants, which you know I'm not against. I think it's great, but at the same time, with the other hand, are we not closing churches and combining parishes and not placing people who retire? And is that not a bit schizophrenic? Who'd like to take that? <laughs> Um, I, so this isn't a definitive answer that expresses all of that. Um, I, think, I think if we're honest, we often, um, we've inherited a model of church um, and a pattern of where church communities are based that was based on what was required for the missionary needs often 100 plus years ago. And any healthy organism, I'm a tree hugger, um, any healthy tree is continuously growing and developing. It's also losing leaves and branches. It's shedding parts as well as growing new parts. 
And insofar as the whole ecosystem of the church is both growing new things as well as saying these things need an honourable end, I'm, I'm all for that. I don't believe that the church of tomorrow will be smaller than the church of today. I believe that Jesus is good news and the church of tomorrow will be much, much bigger and more diverse, representative of the whole breadth of the country. But that requires us to change. And so some things, however fabulous they've been in the past, we will need to let go of them. That's not to say that all restructuring is good restructuring. Thank you. So, Greg. Oh, Roger. Is that okay? Sorry. Um, Rob, um, th there's an image you used at the beginning of your talk about what's the biggest door you can think of. Okay. And I'm just, um, when we were in the regional groups and then see so few focal leads at the moment, yeah, um, there's gatekeepers in every diocese. Uh, not, not because they deliberately say, I'm going to not open the door, but our diocesan bishops are key. Um, and sort of leaving here, so, I mean, from different perspectives on the panel, how do we try and unlock that and, and envision, encourage our diocesan bishops to be envisioned and to sort of get it? Anybody? I, I'm just, I know I said I wouldn't pounce on anybody, but I'm just conscious that Rob, I think, has done a kind of deep listening exercise with some diocesan bishops recently. Is that something that you might answer? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, gosh, who would be a Dawson bishop in current climate? It's an impossible role. And there's something for me in all this. In term, is that cutting out? Um, there's something for me in all this about the way in which we support and we pray and we don't um, a, a kind of victimise or kind of put on pedestals or or, or, or or deference or all that sort of stuff with our hierarchy at the moment. And, you know, the whole sort of sense in terms of if we want to see this rising in a sort of sense of, of, um, of, of focus and importance, then this is a spiritual exercise. It's an exercise which begins on our knees. And I can... If I can thoroughly recommend that all of us here, perhaps as one of the pledges that we might do from being on this conference, is that we pray for those gatekeepers, because doors do open. Having met with a considerable number of our bishops now from over half the diocese across the Church of England as part of this very deep listening kind of exercise in terms of looking at the best ways in which we support ministry in uh, particularly our low-income communities, there is absolute and utter desire from our Darson bishops to get this right and to raise the profile. I've not come across anyone who's told me, Rob, that's a load of rubbish. There is absolute heart for this work. And we are in a particular moment, it seems to me, where an awful lot of our Darson bishops, quite a few of them are retiring quite soon, if you look at their ages. But the ages of those who are currently in positions of responsibility quite often went into ministry in the first place because of the Faith in the City report. That is the, that is the timings in terms of the 40th anniversary. Many of our bishops now get it. They absolutely get the importance of this work, which is why I think there's something of a spiritual exercise here, but there's also something of a corporate exercise here, of recognising that actually we're in this together, and if there's ways in which we can shift the debate together, this general synod debate coming up in February is a key part of all that, um, then, then let's work together. If there's something, stuff, stuff which I can do by picking up the phone to talk to my Episcopal colleagues, um, then I will do that. But we do that in a way which is kind of deeply, deeply corporate. We're on all on the same team in terms of this. But I, but I do think that, that actually our Darson bishops absolutely do get it. There's so much stuff on their plates at the moment, so do pray for them. So just to add one other thought to that, um, in terms of the focal leads especially, I mean, I was having this conversation with Emma earlier, so I'm just going to digest what came out of that conversation. Is, um, and Lynn, you know, correct me if I get this wrong, but I'm anticipating that focal leads have a certain power of convening. And even if you, you're not a focal lead or you don't think you have that power, that anyone can get some people on a Zoom call. <laughs> and so it'd be, I think if you're thinking, well, how do we influence upwards? Uh, or, or uh, maybe not upwards from what Rob said, but you know, influence across. Um, then um, 
it'd be interesting to kind of gather together people in your diocese and who are uh, doing a state's ministry and say, okay, what are you facing? Uh, what, what are the needs we see? What are the hopes and the prayers? If you, if you exercise that power of convening, that amplifies your voice. Um, and then part of the, uh, the work of the EETG is just to provide a kind of a, a, a cover for this and an invitation for it. So mapping is also something we were talking about you know, yesterday and something Dave was sharing so helpfully with us. You know, what are the numbers for your diocese? The numbers don't belong to, to the senior team. You know, they're a matter of public record. And anyway, they, they, they represent people and people don't belong to anybody. So um, just looking at the numbers, looking at the, at the mapping and saying, uh, you know, and the Church of England has really put this big, uh, you know, um, thing on the table and it's going to General Synod, isn't it, as you were saying then yesterday. That's all to provide a, a cover for you to say, OK, team, you know, wh- where? It's, it's not a question of whether... The question is, is where and who and how and how many and and all of the all of the apparatus quite a lot of it is kind of in place <laughs> if you were then to then take that as, as part of a kind of a mutual and collaborative conversation with colleagues uh, and we think that's really exciting yeah it's a bit of a follow-up to Liz's question it's what do we do with the buildings that we have that are unfit for purpose a case study is the parish that I work in. We've got a monstrosity of a Victorian building. Can't afford to heat it. We've just had a couple of, a year ago, we had a quinquennial inspection. Suggests we need to spend probably a hundred thousand pounds to make it watertight. Uh, they insisted we had an inspection and uh, verification of the lightning conductor. Uh, we finally got someone to look at it and discovered there never has been a lightning conductor (laughs) on there. And in 150 years, the Lord hasn't sent a thunderbolt. Uh, uh, (laughs) Yes. Um, Our (laughs) Yes. Our PCC um, has for 10 years been talking about calling in the diocesan arsonist. uh, And... (laughs) Uh, we, since the pandemic, we have actually effectively abandoned the use of that big church building and do all our services in our little mission hall, which is about the size of this room and much more fit for purpose. Uh, we're stuck a little bit because uh, the Diocesan Buildings Committee is recommending us to do things which we can't afford to do, and we haven't actually, our church warden and the 20 or 30 of us, the six of us who really are holding the church in vacancy situation at the moment. We just haven't got the capacity even to sort of uh, subcontract it to anybody. So what do we do in those sort of situations? And I think that sort of story about buildings is probably familiar to a lot of people. Um, Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We've got some absolutely gorgeous historic buildings i think we're one of the chief stewards of historic buildings across the country um but i don't think many of us were trained as museum curators um and some of our buildings many of our buildings are millstones around our neck um it's true in my patch that the um the congregations that are growing the most strongly are those that do not have a historic building to maintain. And they absorb so much missional energy, so much missional energy. So um, I really hope we've got key people in the National Church here listening to this. I really hope that we're all feeding back that something needs to be done at a kind of macro strategic level to give us some ideas about what we do about that. I... I encourage my area deans, my archdeacons, to look at what does the church in this place, what does Christian witness in this place look like in 2033? And actually, we're going to have to make some bold and radical decisions because Nick's right. I think it's Sarah Coakley, the theologian, says that people flows over time change. Churches were where there were flows of people and people flows have changed. We need to position ourselves not only where people flows are now, but where they're going to be in 10 years' time, where the major new housing estates are, all of those things. So uh, so getting a grip on the sheer number of buildings that we have that are weighing us down is an absolute key priority, so I agree, Greg. 
I, I mean, just in terms of adding to that, it's a really great question. So, so uh, the, the the church where I was the vicar in King's Cross, uh, the actual building, kind of an extraordinary building from 1811, has just going through the beginnings of the process for t to go towards demolition. Um, and my heart breaks in terms of thinking about that because I, you know, six years of struggle and toil and all that sort of stuff in that place. However, I think there is a reality sort of sense is that quite a lot of buildings who were put up kind of early to mid Victorian times were put up very quickly and very cheaply. They were the kind of flat pack church buildings of their day, and there is a shelf life. And what what consoles me and all this sort of stuff is a Kind of pr you know, recognizing that we have a God of resurrection, that pruning is quite an important part of the scriptures and how we prune. But there's also a recognition that actually quite a lot of stock that we deal with, you know, we don't, when you're in areas particularly of greatest deprivation, you know, I certainly spent as a vicar in King's Cross, most of the building stuff was sticking plasters in terms of just trying to keep the show on the road in terms of the building. And actually, these buildings have shelf lives, they do. Coming from a church that burnt down, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but the the fact that during um, during the time, whilst you know it was in a in a scout hut that was positioned well next to all the housing estates, um, it um, that was the time of growth. Um, it was a time of uh, in creative missional activity that drew a real diversity of people um, from the street homeless to, um, to, to people on the estate. So especially because there's um, the estates in King's Cross back, at the t back in the day was, yes, there was a lot of um, white working class, but there was also diasporic people from lots of different places from all over um, who, were, who were not just on the edges of communities, but were on the edges of the edges, but were finding home in this in this small, little, low Anglican church that mm -hmm. um, that had a real mixture of different types of worship styles because it was led locally and people were in and out of people's homes. And that was, in some sense, that was my formation. And actually, it created a time for reimagining what church is. And so there's something about how do we continue to missionally resource um, churches that um, might not look attractive because of their building situations. But going actually, there's there's still places for um, creative imagination and what community looks like in those places. I always feel ministry is about people more than buildings, and sometimes we've forgotten about the people, and we're estranged from the people, and we hope that the building will attract the people. Is what I see. I wonder if we can be creative. One of the things that really strikes me in East London is the Round Chapel, where they host some of the most marvellous music events ever. I mean, I love my tunes. But I wonder whether we need to reimagine those spaces and hand them over to the community and say, do you know what? It's one of two things. If you don't want to worship here, why don't we have this as a gift to you as the community so you can... Bless the community and let the community own these spaces because community spaces is not that great. And some of our churches are on real estate that really could be reimagined, as Andrew says. I just wonder if we've got that holy imagination that goes beyond a 2033 to a 2053 because the landscape is changing rapidly with new uh, modal systems, the Elizabeth Line has come in, changed everything, in particularly London, and other places like Manchester with the tramways. Can we reimagine beyond the years? Remember Elijah, when there was the drought, he looked over the horizon, Gehazi, what do you see? What do you see? What is it that we can see beyond these buildings in the changing times. And also, the young people who are around who will see it long beyond us, what do they see? Amen. I've got the mic. Ruth, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the power. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to come back and, and open this up to a bigger conversation, partly because it's like, 
I live in the North East and it's nothing like that. But anyway, I want to change direction if that's okay and pick up on yesterday's uh, talk, yesterday morning, a question that I wanted to ask yesterday but didn't get a chance. And that is this whole thing about, you know, our macroeconomic and even microeconomic context that we're living in at the moment, which basically has the capacity to just drain hope. Um, and it, it struck me while you were talking um, that in the 19th century, the thing that made a difference in terms of social action, Christian social action, was the creation of scandal when the churches realised what was going on in their society that had been hidden and were so scandalised that things started to change. And you could say the same with faith in the city. I know the feeling in the room yesterday was that it failed. I don't think it did fail entirely. I think there were some fantastic things that came out of it. I believe that Unlock was one of them. Um, some short-term benefits, some long-term. But what that did was create scandal. And the response from the churches to that scandal was to rise up. My question is, if and how we as church can create scandal so that those people in our churches who are blind to what's going on... So just as a quick example, in our diocese, um, our churches together, not churches together, uh, together, communities together, Durham, uh, tried to set up a, a session on, on the housing crisis in the light of the Church of England paper. Nobody signed up. Nobody. How can we create scandal in a way that makes Christians rise up? Thank you. A bit tied into somebody said yesterday, is the church angry enough? a little bit tied up in that. Does anybody want to take that? When you talk about scandal, one of the things that we shouldn't do, following on from this morning, is shame ourselves. Because coming out of that negative emotion may not be the best place. I understand what we may wish to mean. Are we angry enough? I think it's only when we see what we see and we choose to see it and we are led to see it by people close enough that can lead us to see it, that we can really open our hearts. But if it's done in a diocesan house in a room, if it's done behind a desk in a vicarage, it ain't going to happen. And so we're going to have to go out and do what those Anglo-Catholics, and shout out to the Anglo-Catholic brothers and sisters, who went out to the slums, and did what they did and said, we're here to help. We're here to show Christ. Wasn't perfect, but they did what they did. I'm not sure our proximity is sometimes close enough to the very people that we might wish to be scanned, that we might want to have a scandal by. And so I'm going to advocate, what is mine, what is your proximity to that which is scandalous. I think we have uh, a precious gift to share as ones who live and serve and are part of the margins. And we can tell those stories and we have a place of power to do that. And you were talking, somebody else was talking about you know, the places of power, that is what we need to take in to the places of, the, of power, is those precious stories that we, that we hold. And um, I often find myself in, in places and think, Lord, why am I here? And then the story comes out and the penny drops from the people in power as they hear the story. Stories transform and change things. That's why Jesus used them. Have a great storage uh, storage bank of stories ready for those when those doors open. Um, uh, it's such a great question, Ruth. I think uh, I just kind of at the risk of stating the, the obvious. Um, the church has created a couple of scandals, <laughs> mm. 
but it's not quite the scandalous dynamic that you are referring to. <laughs> but I just, inspired by this morning, I just think we need to own that and say, actually, that's what's happened. That's where we are. You're like, history... History doesn't always look the same. In fact, it's, it's nature to change, right? And and so we won't always be able to tell the same story again with the same just characters with just different masks on. Like, we we find ourselves in... Like, those of us trying to... We're all trying to exercise Christian leadership, right? And we find ourselves with this... with this. I mean, I don't know, Dina, what you said about shame is so... Is so I, I get it, but... but um, we are managing a set of scandalous things, which are sometimes revelations of the church's actions in history and, and, and the revelations of individuals' acts. And I think one of the things I really appreciated about this morning was, uh, and, and obviously of a, a ton of things, was it was, in, it was effectively an invitation to be a psychologically informed church. So it was actually an act of kind of radically humble listening to a discipline, the discipline of psychology, psychotherapy. And, and um, I, I accept the faith that says, well, actually, Jesus is the key, Jesus is the healer. But what I actually see going on in the, in the, in the language is a profound listening and engagement with the world, even in, a, as you were saying, Betsy, in a kind of Esther-like way. So that's not the posture of the one who is scandalized and says, I must do something. It's the posture of someone who says, I've got something to learn. And until I learn that thing that I've got to learn about what it means to be integrated, then actually I'm kind of, I'm actually not much used to anybody. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be telling the stories. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be, you know, and, and this group isn't such a, a, a powerful testimony to that. I'm just making the point that it might not look like us being the scandalized ones who decide that we should be stirred to action in a kind of godlike way. That there's something, a different kind of posture that was emerging this morning that seemed to unlock something of the spirit, and that's where we need to be paying attention. Um, Thank you for the comments about uh, faith in the city and all, and, and, and all those sorts of things. I think it's really helpful. I don't think we are scandalized enough. I don't think we're angry enough. I don't think we're particularly good at collecting our stories together. I don't think we're particularly good at joined up thinking in terms of what is said to power. I think we work in our own silos. That is my reflection, having done this listening and actually certainly from seeing the way this work kind of operates as a bishop in the Church of England. Um, I also don't, I think we've got a lot of work to do in terms of recognising where power actually lies. I spoke yesterday quite a lot in terms of royalty or state and that sort of stuff, and that's a key part of it all. We saw with the war on Wonga that if you start to change the way in which the banks operate, then organisations like Wonga can be put out of business. So it is not just supporting and focusing on areas of greatest deprivation and so on, but there is something about the way in which global economies operate, which means that in this room, if we're serious about changing the nature of poverty, then the government and those sorts of focuses of our work aren't necessarily the only places to be focusing, because most of our, oh, our diocese, the Church of England and so on, colludes in all sorts of ways with the global banking industry. And that, for me, are the places where we need to be angry about because the processes of economics, the process of capitalism, which all of us, by our bank accounts and so on, will be colluding with. I'm not decrying that kind of stuff. It's not a personal thing in terms of, of, of individuals and that sort of stuff. But there is a sort of sense for us to wake up and desperately see where the power dynamics actually do lie. And that is in the evils which are in terms of global capitalism and the way capitalism operates. Thank you. And the record. Yeah. Um, just to think about the um, maybe the posture that the church could take um, with thinking around Zac um, Zacchaeus going. There's, there needs to be a maybe a reimagination of a posture, a healthy posture of lament, and what does that, what does that look like? 
Um, how is that practiced within our within our communities, um, within the leaders in our communities? Um, what does the self-emptying of what we have, um, not for the salvation of our communities, but for our own salvation? Um, how does that reframe our relationship with our communities? How does that reframe our relationships with with the people on our communities, in our communities? And I think there's, I think there's something to, something that we can sort of look at there. You know, I know we feel that oh, you know, we we are change makers in our communities. Actually, no, we're the ones that need to be changed. So I think it's that way around. It's readdressing our posture within how we act and how we are within our um, uh, communities. Um, so yesterday we heard from about, I don't know, 20 or more uh, parachurch and charity um, organisations and um, well, I can barely remember what I said, so I doubt anyone else can. Um, but um, there's so many organisations out there um, trying to serve and support the church and therefore my question is really how can we, as those organisations, better collaborate and work collectively to serve you, the church, and particularly the church on the margins? Can, should I start off? Um, so um, I was having a conversation with somebody over breakfast, actually, and we were talking about this. He said, and it, and it was the chap from Boys Brigade, um, he said, um, this is great, and there's a real sense in the room that everybody wants to work together to a common goal and, and that we, we want to not lose what we've got here of community and a kind of sense of that. Um, but how do we in our, you know, we go back to our day jobs, how do we contribute how do we do that and and i wonder whether and it is a, just a wonder i wonder whether that there's a kind of um there's a kind of framework here um where you know we can say well boys brigade they're in you know like looking at our youth organization youth ministry you know they're, they're supporting what we're doing with children and young people i wonder whether there's an ability to put together a kind of framework that says, yes, that's where Church Army sits. Church Army can, can cover those areas. Yes, that's where whoever sits, you know, can cover those areas. I do wonder whether we, we need to bring, the, or, or there's a desirability in bringing what we've got here together in terms of looking, maximizing impact, really. Um, I, I do wonder whether there's something in that, but um, I think that's for more discussions, Rachel. Um, I think that's a brilliant question. I'm simply going to air attention, and I wonder if there's attention that... So I work for a parachurch youth organisation called Youthscape, and I'm an on-the-ground church leader and who very rarely uses Youthscape resources. <laughs> because I think one of the challenges... <laughs> one of the challenges, I think, particularly in the line of ministry that we're in, is we are improvisers and innovators instinctively, and youth workers are instinctive innovators and improvisers. Um, and so in our community, I'm learning two years in with this wonderful community, the, the kind of the missional methodology that we bamboozled the SDF with <laughs> doesn't look massively like what we're currently doing because our wonderful community trashed that and want to do it differently. Um, and so because of that, sometimes the kind of the neat boxes and the package resources doesn't really fit. But the deep learning that's gone behind those resources, the parachurch organisation who pour their life into innovating and thinking, what's a, what would be a kind of a theological, what's behind this? That, the older I get and the more I get involved in, in church leadership, that's what I crave I think I might need to adapt the resource, but what, actually what I want is what's gone behind it. Um, and I suppose that's the tension I'd love to air, really, is that I think parachurch organisations who bring uh, thought excellence, um, an innovative heart, bold risk-taking, want to work closely, I think they're going to be the parachurch organisations moving forward that will be running in step with the practitioners on the ground. The ones I think that feel this is our one thing and it has to be done this way or else, th there will be absolute sp spaces for that, absolutely. But I think some of the pioneering, innovative stuff, that I think... So there's a tension. And I'm airing it as someone who's in both camps. So I hope that both sides feel that I've done a fair airing. Coming back to the last question, Ruth, you asked a killer question about the word scandal, but you preempted it by saying, this is not my picture in the northeast around the buildings, and I would like to hear what your experience in the Northeast. I don't know if that's the space, but I thought that was a tantalising point 
Um, and if there's something different to share, I think that would be lovely for the room to hear. <laughs> Uh, so, I uh, want to very briefly, if I may, talk about two churches in one city. And uh, I attended both of these churches. Um, they both had very similar attendance levels. One was in the poorest area of the city, and one was in one of the richest areas of the city. The poorest one could barely afford to pay its heating bill. Often the heating wasn't on. It had three burglaries in two months. The one in the richest area was spending hundreds of thousands of pounds of legacy donations on art, a pretty new door it didn't need. And the PCC had just agreed to raise the rent on one of their properties because it would be poor financial stewardship not to, given that rents were rising in the area. How is this right? <laughs> How do we change it? And also, very quickly, I'm really glad that Rob mentioned capitalism, because it feels to me like the elephant in the room, and it feeds into all of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who wants to take that? Oh. Yeah, uh, this will be my second hospital pass of the uh, morning. Um, at the risk of really irritating one of my colleagues who's not here, um, I, in many ways, the Church of England doesn't exist. Because the Church of England is made up of um, a number of national institutions. There are actually seven of them. Seven may be the perfect number, but I'm not convinced it's the perfect number of national institutions. Uh, and then there are 42 dioceses. There are 22 theological colleges and courses currently. And uh, then there are about 12,500 parishes, and I don't yet know the number of parachurch organizations, but there, there are probably about 50 of those, um, and a number of mission agencies and others. Um, all of them are technically legally independent. And yet all of us are spiritually and ethically interdependent. And if we want to be healthy and whole, we need to recognize our interdependence whilst being um, honest about our legal independence from one another. So a parish can turn around and say, we're not prepared to contribute to the common fund or parish share in the diocese. Um, that they're perfectly legally entitled to do that. Of course, it has consequences for the diocese's ability to do other work in other places and, and potentially in that parish. So it denies the interdependence and, and what many of us would describe as our Catholicity. So is it right that a wealthy parish is sitting on the doorstep of a poor one and the wealthy one is um, gilding a lily while the um, poor one is struggling to provide basic accommodation? Of course it's not. How can anybody defend that? But that requires hearts and minds on the ground to change. It's not something that we can change in some kind of central edict. And, and one of the very striking things about my role within the National Church Institutions, I have almost no power other than to invite and to encourage and to... Um, uh, convene and create spaces that people want to step into rather than, no, I'm telling you that that's how it's going to be from now on. That doesn't exist. I don't have any of those levers of power. Um, I'd love it if Nick could change it all and that didn't happen. <laughs> but he can't. The National Church can't for reasons he's um, articulated very well. But it comes down to relationship. It comes down to crossing the road. And often, actually, we who are perceived as the less and the weaker are able because we come not carrying huge amounts of gold with us. We are able to cross over the road to our brothers and sisters who are 
incumbent in who are they are encumbered by wealth actually there is a gift in needing to be interdependent with our brothers and sisters and we we may need to cross the road and meet them in their place because actually i think that that what you were talking about i think who was the poorer parish there I think the poorer parish was the wealthy parish in that scenario. Um, we, uh, we are a poor BMO. We, when we went to church plant, our latest church plant, we had no money in the bank to do that. And God just gave us the money to do that. We have the privilege of knowing the Father's provision in a way that our big resource sending church doesn't know God's provision in the same way because they can be independent um, and we can't be. One of my good mates, who you know, Rachel, always says to me, we need to learn how to share and play nicely. He says it to me constantly when we're on the phone to each other. We're not very good at sharing. And we're not very good at the moment at playing nicely. If we're being honest. So what does it mean for you and I to share and play nicely? Because a lot of these things, if we are, you know, Jesus talks about children it always comes back to children and young people, doesn't it? Always. If we don't learn those things foundationally as a child and a young person, when we get become adults, it just gets harder and harder and harder. And our hearts and change is really difficult unless God does the miraculous. The other part of it is who is Jesus Christ to you and I? Because that's the fundamental question that is going to be here. Who is Jesus Christ to you in that we shared the best of Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ to our communities that we show how communities can be the best that they can be? One of the things we haven't mentioned here today and I'm hoping we might do some more work, is our theological reflection. What's the underpinning of what we're doing here that points to the Jesus that you and I know? And how does that look? And I just want to ask us, how do we share and play nicely? Um, when thinking about the relationship between, um, when this does happen, a relationship between a rich church and a poor church, um, if the relationship is purely financial, there is one of power, there's one of control, there's one of saying, this is, this is what you should look like, um, but you'll never get there. Uh, um, and it will always be a, a relationship of dependence. But if we're looking at the relationship between the rich church and the poor church as one as formation, um, that there's something that, not even just something small, but actually something major, that how to form yourself as community is yeah. being found on the edges then that, I, think there's, I think there's that change of, of focus. I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. Hi, is it switched on? Great stuff. I'd just like to say this, thank you. This, the heart of everybody to work towards reaching the people on the estates. I grew up in Castle Milk in Glasgow. So at the time, it was the biggest house in the state in Europe. And now at age 57, I'm realizing, I was talking about this yesterday, the impact that people who love Jesus had on my life. And it's so important what you're trying to do. So I've now got, I've come from being a kid from a single parent household, my mum with alcohol issues. And um, I wanted to be a police officer because I wanted to help people where I was affected. and. Do you know what? Now I've got a little army of people all over the country 
Christian police officers, and I would like to offer you the opportunity. I've got an on and off duty magazine, and it's got a circulation initially of like 2,000. I'm going to go and report on all these amazing things that you're doing, but I'd like to ask you, how can we, how can the Christian police officers, they're like, I've tried to figure out what kind of part of the body of Christ we are. I'm wondering if we may be like a protective skin across the country. I'm not sure. I'm going to, I love analogies. But what can we do to help you reach your, your strategic goals and objectives? What can I write in that magazine for you, panel, that would help the police to take their part in, in enabling you to do what you want to do? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. I mean, isn't that great? You know, I, I was raised by a single mum as well and, and then became a single mum myself. So um, there's lots of things that resonate here across, across many of us. So thank you for sharing that. And I, I think what I've come away with, and I, I, I think we need to have a, a conversation as the Estates Evangelism Task Group on this, because quite a few members of the task group are here. I think we need to take what has come out of this last 24 hours back and think what next because there there seems to be every so many people have come up to me and said i want to know what to do next i want to know where this is going and and um and it kind of feels in a general election year as well um that that we have some agency here um so so i think i'd like to take back um what has been said and what has been fed back to us and, and then come back to you. But I think for now, if you can say that what's happening in the church is a good news story, and that estates communities are open, very open to working with partners, and that we have estates focal leads in 35 dioceses, and we can circulate who they are in each diocese, that people can contact as a first port of call for estates ministry in those dioceses, I think that would be really helpful. Are we able to go back to, have we got Ruth? Ruth, do you want to just come back quickly? Do you mind, Malcolm? Can, do you just want to come back quickly on Rachel's point about what did you mean about the, the buildings issue? Yeah, as long as there's time. I mean, we probably should have a longer conversation. It's just that, you know, as, as that conversation was going on, I'm just thinking about the kind of, um, the kind of communities that I'm working with in the Durham Diocese ex-mining villages that are kind of semi-rural, often isolated, poor transport links, terrible housing conditions, church buildings that are falling down, church communities that are being labelled unviable. And these are Christian people who deserve to have their worshipping communities supported and that have the potential to grow um, I just think it's a very complicated picture, but I, I think I'm a northerner. I'm bound to get defensive because London is not the north. And, and, and we do need to take seriously our different contexts and our different challenges. That's, that's all it was about. Yeah, thank you. You're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. Malcolm? Um, thank you. Um, I'd just like to make two short points, really. One is sort of picking up what Nick said about the nature of the Church of England. And it reminded me of something I said at the very first estates gathering when we started this project off years ago at Bishop Thorpe, that this is an area of ministry where people know their need of each other across difference. The Church of England has always, for over 400 years, been a somewhat unstable coalition. Under the first Elizabeth, Basically, she said, play nicely, stop killing each other in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. and focus on the parish. Worship with your neighbour, even if you think he's a wretched heretic, mm -hmm. with some limitations, of course. And we are living in an age at the moment when all coalitions are beginning to fray at the edges. Look at the Tory party. For decades, one of the most efficient coalitions mm -hmm. at clinging on to power. And so, I, as I say to bishops and archbishops, don't think it's all about us, because our coalition seems to be fraying at the edges. It's coalitions that are falling to bits. Mm -hmm. But estate ministry is the opposite story to that in so many ways. Evangelicals on estates know that to grow the body of Christ, you have to engage with the lives of the people there. 
and more liberal people on estates know that in order to engage with the lives of the people there in an incarnational ministry, you have to have a cohort of people who believe in Christ. So you've got to build up the church. And at that first estates gathering, one of the most noticeable things was that the constant Anglican tension between tribes was absent. Let's keep it that way because we are defying the law of the age, which is that coalitions can't hold together. Second very quick point. Capitalism's been mentioned, thanks, Rob. I just would say if we blanket condemn capitalism, it makes us terribly easy to dismiss as naive because we're not the opposite. We don't believe in totalitarian thinking. It's the particular phase of capitalism we're in that is the problem, not the fundamental approach of capitalism, I believe, which is, like so many things, the worst of all possible systems except all the others. But we are in a particularly dismal phase of capitalism where the sucking out of value from the majority to the minority has gone to the point where the majority are now turning to people like Trump in their distress. This is a really dangerous phase of capitalism, but it's not capital. If we just say we're prob we find capitalism a problem, we will be dismissed as naive and economically illiterate because I don't think we believe in some of the alternatives to capitalism. Thank you, Malcolm. We're, we're actually at the end. Is there anybody else, Kenny? There is the gentleman in blue. Did you want to share? Do you want to just have one final quick, and then we, we're going to have a five-minute break, and then, and then the Eucharist. Um, if we've got a heart to double the number of children and young people by 2030, um, and that needs a significant investment in training youth workers, children's workers. Um, so I'd like to, one, is asked a question... I already had no part of the answer to this, but I'm asking it for the, the, everybody here, is what are we doing about that? Secondly, having worked on the ground as a detached youth worker for many years, we know that is the beating heart of region our estates. And there's very, very little funding or investment going into that. So what, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to raise the profile so that we can get the old school youth workers out on the ground meeting people where they are, building relationships. We know relationship is key. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think there are moves to absolutely flood resource in that direction. So I think it is about us developing, getting our readiness, a strategy, resource, follow strategy. If I could be provocative in that space, my prayer is that there is a lot of resource uh, that comes in the direction of these churches. The interesting thing, sitting here, I'm a bit of an outlier, so I'm part of a church plant that has a lot of resource, and I'm sat in a room hearing stories of leaders who are doing the most extraordinary thing with nothing and what we don't have. What I think will be quite interesting in this space is just an observation and a question, I suppose. If we are flooded with lots of resource, that is actually a shift in how we are working. Um, and I think that's an interesting question to ask ourselves. What does it mean to be serving and building churches in deprived communities as churches that actually receive suddenly a lot of resource? That is going to be an interesting question for us. Um, how do we do that well? And so I did arrive here today feeling a bit like I'll keep that on the lowdown, that I've, we've got seven members of staff that we employ, because that feels like a new space. But wouldn't it be amazing if the economy moving forward is these models of youth ministry excellence that are heavily resourced in the most deprived communities, like really bold resourcing. So yes, my prayer is that it's coming, but it's not 30,000 paid employed youth workers on the horizon. I think it's going to be lots of lay leaders, lots of apprentices. So it's about us casting vision, calling people to youth ministry as a vocation. I'm not sure that we're doing that very well at the moment. Thank you. So um, I'm going to draw it together now. Can we thank our panel?